Outcomes, Upper Intermediate, Workbook by Amanda Morris, published by National Geographic Learning, a part of Cengage Learning, copyright 2016. One point one. One. What did you think of it? It was okay, but it wasn't as good as I'd expected. Really. I thought it was the best film I've seen in ages. I couldn't take my eyes off the screen for a second. Yeah, it was gripping, but they'd missed out loads of details. You see, I've read the book several times. It's one of my favourites, but they just didn't stick to the plot. Some of the most important parts of the story were just jumped over. I wish they wouldn't do that. And they even made the main character less complicated than she was in the book. I just think that they should be true to the original story. Two. There's so much more variety nowadays. When I was younger, people used to go out to have fun, to the cinema, theatre or to a concert. Now technology has changed everything, so it's all at your fingertips at home. People can listen to music, watch a DVD, even watch the cup final live, all in the comfort of their own home. It's convenient, but people don't socialise like they used to. I think that's a great shame. Even people in the same family don't share or enjoy entertainment together. Three. You used to be a really keen theatre-goer, didn't you? Do you still go a lot? Not as much as I'd like to. I suppose it's quite expensive nowadays. Eh, it's not so much that. In fact, you can get some really good deals if you book online. And there are often discounted tickets during the week. Uh, the thing is, I spend every spare moment on my course. It's really hard working full-time and studying for my Masters. At times, life gets pretty dull, and I think about giving it up. But it's the last year now, so I ought to keep going. I'm just looking forward to when I can get my life back. Four. I suppose it's not bad here, considering it's only quite a small town. We've got the usual things. A multi-screen cinema, a couple of clubs, pubs and restaurants, and a small local museum. But if you want to see a top band, opera, or even a play, you need to go into one of the bigger cities nearby. It's the teenagers I feel sorry for. I mean, there really isn't much for them to do. And then, when they get to 18, it's hardly surprising they spend the whole weekend in the pub. Five. Richard, will you turn that TV off, please? Sure. This film's nearly finished anyway. No, Richard, I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Turn it off now. <sighs> Why are you getting on my case? I must be the only kid in my class without a TV in his room. It's just not fair. If you bought me my own TV, I could watch it when I wanted. That's the whole point. I don't want you to watch any more TV. You already watch far too much. You hardly ever do anything else. You never touch the guitar we bought you, and that cost a fortune. Six. It really annoys me when people complain about the local art scene. Just last month, our town put on an exhibition and sale of local artists and craftspeople. Lots of people put forward their work. Painters, photographers, weavers and furniture makers. And it was well promoted in the local paper and online. And what happened? There were hardly any visitors. It was awful. We had two or three people an hour. It was just such a disappointment. What was the point of all those artists being there? One point two. One. I wish they wouldn't do that. I just think that they should be true to the original story.
too. People used to go out to have fun. People don't socialize like they used to. Three. You used to be a really keen theatre goer. Not as much as I'd like to. Four. It's the teenagers I feel sorry for. I mean, there really isn't much for them to do. Five. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. I don't want you to watch any more TV. Two point one. I can't believe it's our last day already. So, what do you feel like doing? Well, we mustn't miss the annual parade tonight. It's supposed to be amazing. Everyone dresses up and they play traditional music and songs. It starts in the town square and then goes all the way through the main streets. Sounds like fun. So that's this evening organized. Just the rest of the day to plan. <laughs> According to the guidebook, the city museum has one of the best collections of modern and abstract art in the country.、Mm, to be honest, I'm not that keen on modern art. It's all a bit too weird for me. <laughs> no problem. We can give that a miss. The book also recommends a tour of the temple ruins. Apparently, you can get some great views of the city from up there. How long does it take to get there? About an hour and a half by bus. Hmm, three hours there and back is quite a long time out of our day, and unfortunately, it's not the kind of place you can see in just a short time. Okay, so let's stay nearer to the centre. There must be something interesting we can do. Just a second. A friend of mine recommended the street market here. She said it's packed with amazing local crafts and stalls with souvenirs and stuff. Street market. Oh, here it is in the guidebook. Take a trip into the past and soak up the atmosphere at the street market, where stallholders wear traditional costume and demonstrate local crafts. The aromas of sweetly scented oils mix gently with herbs and spices, etc., etc. Sounds good, but it closes at one o'clock, so we'd need to go there first. Fine by me. So. We spend the morning at the market, and we end up at the parade. How about going back to the old town after lunch? Hmm. I think we've seen everything there, haven't we? I took loads of photos of the buildings. The architecture was stunning. Hmm. It was pretty amazing. But you're right. We ought to see something different. Have another look at what's around the main square. We need to be up there for the parade anyway. Good thinking. Hmm. There's the old merchant's house. A private house dating back to the 18th century now open to the public. The collection of art and objects collected by the owner and his family provides a delightful insight into history in an informal setting. Open today until seven. Ideal. We can have a drink in the square before the parade starts. Sure, but we'd better get going. The market has already started. Two point two, one. It starts in the town square and then goes all the way through the main streets. Two. The city museum has one of the best collections of modern and abstract art in the country. Three. It's not the kind of place you can see in just a short time. Four. Take a trip into the past and soak up the atmosphere at the street market. Five. So we spend the morning at the market, and we end up at the parade. Six. We need to be up there for the parade anyway. Three point one. Speaker one. A lot of people confuse what they need with what they want. They think they really must have that bigger house, the latest mobile phone, a designer top, or some luxury food. To me, the difference between wants and needs is clear. We all only really need somewhere to live: food and water, basic health and hygiene products, and clothes for different situations. 
all the other stuff is really just what we want, things that make us feel better for a time. My advice is just to ask, do I really need this? And if the answer is yes, then of course I'll go ahead and buy it. But most of the time, the answer is no. (laughs) It may sound a bit dull to people who love shopping, but it means I don't have any credit card debts to pay and my apartment isn't full of useless stuff. Speaker 2 I used to be a complete shopaholic. All my spare time was taken up with trips to shopping malls, buying and selling on eBay and browsing my favourite internet sites. I remember in one weekend I bought six pairs of trousers, eight shirts, around 20 CDs and a new mobile phone. In fact, in one year I changed my mobile eight times. Every time I saw my friends they said, go on then, show us your new phone. Anyway, by the time I was 20, I had debts of around £20,000. A thousand pounds for every year of my life. Then losing my job was the reality check I needed. I couldn't pay any of the bills. It was so scary. Now I realise I didn't really need all that stuff, and I'm slowly paying off what I owe. And I've had the same mobile phone for years. Speaker 3 I don't really plan my spending, even when I go food shopping. I just look around and spot what's on special offer. I always go for the buy one, get one free and three for two deals in the supermarket. (laughs) I sometimes end up with loads of bottles of shampoo, but I guess it's always useful. The high street is full of great value shops nowadays. I usually pop into one or two of them on my way home from work. They're full of cheap clothes and accessories and they always have a sale rail of cut price stuff. I'll usually pick up one or two things each week. In fact, just yesterday I bought a bag, a pair of sandals, a pair of jeans and two white shirts. When I got home I realised I already had six white shirts but I can always put one or two in the charity shop. Speaker 4 I used to be a dream customer. If I saw something I liked, I would always buy it. It didn't matter if it was in a shop window, in a magazine or catalogue, on a website or even in an auction. See it, want it, buy it, used to be my motto. I have a good salary and so money has never been a problem and I've never been very much in debt. A couple of years ago... I decided I needed a bigger flat because I was running out of space for all my stuff. Then I saw a TV program on impulse buyers like me and they came across really badly, just like spoilt children. I decided there and then that I had to stop being so self-indulgent. I took bags and bags of things to the charity shop and stayed in my old flat. I still enjoy shopping but I don't have to buy something every time. Speaker 5 I love all shopping opportunities, not because I'm a shopaholic, but because I earn a living by getting people to buy things. It's my job to make people aware of the benefits of different brands so that they sell well. Nowadays, there's a lot of talk about people being addicted to shopping and buying stuff they don't need. But what would happen if we only bought the basics in life? Our economy would suffer, workers in the developing world would lose their jobs, and life would be very dull. I'm not saying that people should get into serious debt, but to have the car, the phone, or the food that you want makes life fun. We all work very hard in this country, and not to have a few luxuries on the way would be very hard. It's all a question of balance, but we also have to be realistic. Shopping is one of the most popular leisure activities in the Western world, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Three point two, one. They think they really must have that bigger house, 
the latest mobile phone, a designer top, or some luxury food. 2. We all only really need somewhere to live. Food and water, basic health and hygiene products, and clothes for different situations. 3. I remember in one weekend, I bought six pairs of trousers, eight shirts, around 20 CDs, and a new mobile phone. 4. In fact, just yesterday, I bought a bag, a pair of sandals, a pair of jeans, and two white shirts. 5. It didn't matter if it was in a shop window, in a magazine or catalogue, on a website, or even in an auction. 6. Our economy would suffer, workers in the developing world would lose their jobs, and life would be very dull. Four point one. Have you got today's paper, Adam? I want to catch up on the news. Sorry, I haven't. I've given up on buying a paper. I just can't be bothered reading it anymore. So, how do you find out what's going on? I usually check online for any update on the most important stories, or I listen to the headlines on the radio. To be honest, I find the news so depressing just now. Everywhere you turn, the only thing you hear about is the recession and people going bankrupt. And it's the same at work. I walked into the office the other day, said good morning, and my colleague replied, what's good about it? Why was he in such a bad mood? He'd just been reading the paper. He told me what was going on, and then I felt fed up too. <laughs> oh, sounds like you need cheering up. You should check out that website that covers only good news. What's it called again? Um... The Good News Network, or something like that. What's that? I've never heard of it. I just came across it one day when I was online. It's an American site set up by a woman who used to work in TV news, and she just wanted to give people access to some more positive stories. <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'm interested in stories about cats and flowers. It's not like that. They deal with serious issues like the economy, crime and the environment, but they select only news stories that have a more positive content. When I first saw the website, they had headlines on signs of economic growth in the US economy and a drop in crime in the States too, despite the recession. So it's all about the USA? No good news in any other part of the world? Of course not. They cover international news too. There were stories from Europe, China and South America when I looked. But if it's all good, is it really news? They must have quite a lot of cute stories about animals and stuff. Sure, they do have those feel-good stories about family life and pets, but you don't have to read them if you don't want to. For me, it just gave a bit of balance. In TV news and newspapers, the biggest stories all tend to be the negative ones. Tell me about it, Natalie. I'm the one who's given up on newspapers, don't forget. Four point two, one. I've given up on buying a paper. It just gave a bit of balance. Two. They deal with serious issues like the economy. I just can't be bothered reading it. Three. The only thing you hear about is the recession. You should check out that website. 4. They had headlines on signs of economic growth. How do you find out what's going on? 5. I listened to the headlines on the radio. My colleague replied, what's good about it? 6. They cover international news. They must have quite a lot of cute stories. 5.1 Welcome back to Sports Talk. We'll be catching up on all the sporting headlines in just a while, but first, one of our regular features on less common sports that are played around the country. Today, it's the turn of touch rugby, 
and in the studio we have two keen players, Angie Mitchell and Simon Parker. Angie, let's start with you. And if you don't mind me saying, you're a woman and you play on the same team as the guys. <laughs> yes, Nick, that's right. Touch rugby is for pretty much everyone. You can play in men's, women's and mixed teams. It's a sport that's growing in popularity around the world because it appeals to lovers of traditional rugby and people who've never played it. OK, so how did it all start and how similar is it to the original game of rugby? Touch rugby started in Australia in the 1960s as a warm-up game for players of the traditional sport. What's great about it is the simplicity. All you need is a rugby ball, a space to play and a group of friends. The object of the game is for each team to score touchdowns and to prevent the opposition from scoring. So, in terms of how you play, it's similar to rugby, but without the tackling, scrumming, you know, all the really physical stuff. So, Simon, it's quite a soft game then. No, not at all. It's very fast and exciting. There's a lot of running involved, so people find that their fitness levels improve really quickly. It's a great way to get your heart pumping and burn off those excess kilos. And people develop stamina, ball skills and hand-eye coordination, like in a lot of team sports. Hmm, sounds quite demanding. Yes, it can be. But to be honest, we get people of all shapes, sizes and ages. You can play at your own level. It's so simple that after two to three games, you get the basic skills. Then it's up to you to keep playing and develop your game. And as with everything, the more you play, the better you become. So what brought you two into the game? Simon? I'd got really out of shape due to my job. I used to travel a lot for work and so couldn't find the time to exercise. I'm not really one for working out at the gym or jogging. Then I changed my job and a lot of my colleagues played touch rugby and they invited me along. Hmm. And you, Angie? Uh, I was looking for something my husband and I could do together, I suppose. I've tried a lot of sports in my time, everything from aerobics to windsurfing. And he's really sporty too, but we never did any of these activities together. So we both joined up at our local club and we've been enjoying the game for the last 18 months or so. Very interesting to hear about that. Thanks to you both. Check out our website for more information on touch rugby. Sounds like a fun thing to do. Now, over to Jilly for the... Five point two. One. You can play in men's, women's and mixed teams. Two. It's similar to rugby, but without the tackling. Three. We get people of all shapes, sizes and ages. Four. It's so simple that after two to three games, you get the basic skills. Five. It's up to you to keep playing and develop your game. Six point one. One. Phil, where on earth are we? Don't worry. I'm sure it's just over there. I remember seeing that group of trees. Yes, this is it. What are you doing? We're trying to sleep. Oops. Sorry. We're lost, aren't we? And I'm so tired. I need my sleeping bag. I know, Lisa. I need mine too. But everything looks the same at this time of night. I can't stand this anymore. I'm covered in mud. I'm going to sleep in the car. Oh, no need. Shh. Sorry. No need. It's over there. I can see my shorts hanging on the rope. Oh, thank heavens for that. 2. Right, Claire, Eddie, after 3, open your eyes. 1 2 Three! Surprise! We've given this boring old cottage a bright new makeover. 
OK, starting in here, we've had the original fireplace taken out and a new gas fire put in. And we've had new lighting installed, so it's much more modern. Uh, what? Why? Why? <laughs> and our very own Leonardo da Vinci, decorator Mike, has painted a lovely mural on the wall. <laughs> Look, it shows the view out of your kitchen window. Why do we need to have the view inside the house? Oh, it's just a design feature. And what have you done with our lovely wooden floors? They're all different colours. Well spotted! Yes, the floor of each room has been painted. So we have green, blue, red... Stop, stop, I can't oh. stand it. You've ruined our home. Eddie, we're going to have to change it all back. Uh, so, a few small changes may be needed here for Eddie and Claire. That's it from Home is Where the Heart is. Join us again next week when we'll be... Three. Hi, Magda. Have you just finished your shift? Oh, hi, Helen. No, not yet. It's been really hard work today. It's taken me an hour and a half to do just one room. Oh, sorry to hear that. Had the guests left the rooms in a bit of a mess? You could say that. It looked like the couple in room 129 had a huge party. <laughs> there were bottles and glasses everywhere, and half-eaten food from room service. Half of it was trodden into the carpet. Oh, what a nightmare. Considering that this is a five-star hotel, we get some very demanding guests. Well, money doesn't buy you good manners, I suppose. You're right there, Magda. Listen, go and have a break now. I'll ask Gita to come and help you with the rest of your rooms. Thanks, Helen. That's great. Six point two. Ear. A. I. Oi. Six point three. One. Boy. Nowadays. Spoilt. Employment. Two. Sight. Fixed. Quite. Height. Three. Liar. Weird. Idea. Beer. Four. Leader. Self-catering. Breakdown. Training. Seven point one. Hey, Jan, did you hear about that guy who thinks he's found a new type of cloud? A new type of what? Cloud. You know, those things that are up in the sky. They're usually black and full of rain in this country. OK, no need to be sarcastic. <laughs> Sorry. I just thought it was really interesting. Apparently this guy, I uh, can't remember his name now, was sent photos from around the world showing these clouds in really weird shapes. They're not like anything people had really seen before. Eddie, are you winding me up? It's not April Fool's Day, is it? No, look, I'll show you on my laptop. Um, it, here it is. Gavin Pretapini. That's him. He set up the Cloud Appreciation Society. No way. You're kidding. Let me see that. Wow, you're right. Those photos are amazing. They look like they've been created on a computer. In this one, it looks like there's a huge storm about to break. Look at all those dark shapes. Apparently, they aren't necessarily storm clouds. Sometimes they just break up without actually turning into a storm. Really? Look, this one's a bit like the surface of the sea when it's really rough and choppy. I <laughs> know. In fact, that cloud guy is suggesting they call the new formation Asperatus, which is Latin for rough. Wow, you've really got into this, haven't you? So, who is this cloud guy? Click on that link to his society. I've never heard of it before. OK. Cloud Appreciation Society. Boop, 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 boop. 
Seems like he's set it up just because he enjoys looking at clouds. He just loves the beauty and the variety. Well, as hobbies go, it's quite unusual, but people must be interested if he's set up a society. So, what happens now with this new cloud? I'm not sure. Let's have a look. Um. Well, apparently the Royal Meteorological Society is collecting evidence of the weather patterns that produce asperatus clouds. Right. Who would have thought a cloud could create so much interest? It's incredible. I know, really amazing. You were a bit sceptical at first, but I'm glad you found it interesting. I showed the pictures to my family, but it left them cold. Ah, oh, well, you can't please everyone. Seven point two, one. A new type of what? Two. Eddie, are you winding me up? It's not April Fool's Day, is it? Three. No way. You're kidding. Let me see that. Four. Wow. You're right. Those photos are amazing. Five. Wow, you've really got into this, haven't you? Six. Who would have thought a cloud could create so much interest? Eight point one, part one. Good afternoon and welcome to Bookmark, our weekly look at the world of books and literature. Today we have a special feature on that perennial favourite of many of our listeners, crime fiction. The genre has moved from quite humble beginnings to a multi-million pound industry. Gone are the days when to write about crime was to be a second-class author, and reading crime fiction was seen as something less than challenging. Our special guest is Victoria Marshall, director of Black Orchid Publishers, who specialise in crime fiction. Victoria, welcome. Part two. Thank you, Marcus. Great to be here. So, Victoria, just how popular is crime fiction today? Well, the latest figures show that crime books and thrillers represent 59% of the general fiction market. That's a staggering 22 million books. Wow. That's a lot more than I would have guessed. Uh, is that why you decided to set up a publishing house just for the crime genre? Well, in fact, we didn't. Initially, we were a general fiction publisher who did a bit of everything, really. You know, romance, science fiction, even horror and ghost stories. But it was clear in the first few years that the crime writers were by far the most successful. So, slowly but surely, we started to focus on just crime and detective stories. And it's paid off. Two of our authors, Leo Hunt and Belinda Warriner, have won the coveted Page Turner of the Year Award, so that has helped to put us on the publishing map. Mm, it sounds like it was a good move, but what actually is it about crime fiction that we love so much? Why do people continue to buy books year in, year out? Of course, some people enjoy being scared in a kind of safe way, but the one thing all readers love is a good plot. Mm. It's the aspect of having a puzzle to solve that gets people coming back time and time again. Even if a reader has a favourite detective like Hercule Poirot or Inspector Rebus, a plot that is full of twists and turns will keep them turning the pages and picking up the next novel in the series. So crime fans are among the most dedicated then? Yes, I would say so. Another important thing, of course, is the sheer variety of characters, settings and plots. I had a quick look at some of the newly published titles and they're literally set in countries all over the world, from green and leafy cities like Oxford and Edinburgh to the sultry and gritty streets of Havana, even rural parts of Scandinavia. Mm. The genre is also very diverse in terms of timing of the plots. We're all familiar with Agatha Christie's portrayal of England in the 1920s, but crime novels can take you much further back in time to Renaissance Italy, 11th century Japan, ancient Rome, even ancient Egypt. Amazing. 
But would you say there's a gender split in the readership? I mean, do more men read or write crime fiction? Well, I don't have any up-to-date figures on the readership, but I'd say that the genre has something for everyone. There was a time when it was thought of as more of a male area of interest, but there are plenty of female writers and readers, of course. And is the debate still on as to who makes better crime writers, men or women? <laughs> oh, that one will never go away. <laughs> as a publisher, it's our job to encourage talent wherever it comes from, so I don't tend to worry too much about the gender side of things. A good story is a good story, after all. Very diplomatically put. <laughs> well, thanks, Victoria. Great to see you. And you can go to our website for a list of Victoria's all-time top ten. See if you agree with her choice. And let us know about your... Eight point two. Ow. O. Air. Ur. Eight point three. One. No. Crown. Thousand. Surround. Two. Although. Promote. Court. Throat. Three. Plural. Tour. Cure. Sour. Four. Dreadful. Where. Millionaire. Prayer. Nine point one. Hello and welcome to Education Matters. A look at the packed school bag of the average teenager will tell you that the national curriculum is crammed with different subjects. There is often talk of streamlining the number of subjects, so let's get some opinions from those who attend school every day. But we're not asking the students. This time, it's the teacher's turn. So, Martine, Greg and Wendy, all teachers at a local secondary school, which two subjects would you cut? Martine, let's start with you. Uh, I think PE and RE. So, that's physical education and religious education? Sorry, yes. I think sport is best done in after-school clubs. Um, the sporty students can choose what they like best and become good at it. And I think religious education is best left to the family. It shouldn't have anything to do with state education, like the system we have in France. Um, I agree about cutting RE, but not PE. A lot of our kids are already pretty unfit. For some of them, an hour's PE is the only exercise they get. And it teaches them about winning and losing. I think it can also help with behaviour problems. You know, doing something active gets rid of excess energy and just breaks up the day. So, Greg, which subjects would get your vote? As I said, I agree with Martine about RE. If students want to find out about a religion, they can do so outside school. Um, my other choice would be ICT. That's Information and Communications Technology. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Basically, computer studies, yeah? More or less, yes. My feeling is that there's no need to teach it as a separate subject. In a well-equipped school, ICT should be part of every lesson. And most kids have computers at home and are pretty proficient at using them anyway. Can I come in here? Wendy, you've been waiting patiently. Yeah, I have to say, I'm not with Greg on ICT. There's more to computers than just playing games or chatting on MSN. And that's what kids use their home computers for. Wide-ranging computer skills are essential for our future economy. I'm not saying that we shouldn't teach computer skills. I mean, we should integrate them across other subjects. I just don't see it that way. It's too important not to cover properly in the syllabus. So, Wendy, what would you lose from the current list of subjects? Personal, social and health education, PSHE for short, and, sorry Martine, modern foreign languages. But learning a language... Just a second, Martine. Let Wendy have her say and we'll come back to you.
I just think that a lot of time is dedicated to foreign languages, and quite a lot of students still struggle to come up with one or two sentences. I'm not saying get rid of languages altogether, but just make them optional so that the kids who have aptitude are the ones who take them up. I agree with Wendy up to a point. My job would be much easier if all my students were good at French. That's obvious. But even weaker students can make progress if they have help. And it's not just about the words. Learning a language gives students the opportunity to find out about other cultures and societies, and that's so important in today's global economy. Okay, we're running out of time. So your other subject, Wendy? I would do away with PSHE. A lot of it can be integrated into other subjects, like covering drug and alcohol education in science lessons. I'm with you on that, Wendy. It's not an essential subject in its own right. Yes, I'd also agree with that. A lot of the kids think PSHE is a bit of a waste of time. We might as well cut it. So, some consensus here at last. Thanks to Martine, Greg, and Wendy for their opinions. Nine point two, one. I think P E and R E. Two. I'm not with Greg on I C T. Three. I would do away with P S H E. Four. Nine point three. B B C. UCLA, ATM, VAT, UN, FBI, IMF, PC, SMS, ISP, Ten point one. Oh, what's this now? I was about to go for lunch. Oh, it's from my friend Abigail. Let's have a look. Oh, she's having a party. Not another one. <laughs> Don't sound so enthusiastic, Emma. I thought she was a good friend of yours. She is, and I don't mean to sound horrible, but there have been so many parties and get-togethers recently. I had my cousin's hen do last month. Well, it was more of a hen weekend, not just a few drinks out with the girls the night before the wedding. She booked a spa weekend in Portugal. She paid for the hotel, but we had to cover our flights and all the treatments. It cost a fortune, much more than I hoped. Then we had the wedding itself, of course, and this month I've been to six kids parties already. Six. Well, all kids have birthday parties. Yes, I know, but it's not like the old days. You know, when you turned up, dropped the kids off, and picked them up a few hours later. Modern mums like to organise an event or a function, swimming pool parties, haunted house parties, and these places are so big. It means the parents have to go along too. So you have to dress up in your party gear, make polite conversation for hours, and help to clear up. It's exhausting. I know that some parents do go over the top. Tell me about it. My sister's the same. Her husband retired, so I was expecting a nice family meal in a local pub, just for the adults. But no, she booked the four-star place down by the river. And invited seventy-five people. I didn't know they knew seventy-five people, <laughs> and I wouldn't mind. But my brother-in-law Keith hates being the centre of attention. Why organise a big party for someone who won't even enjoy it? Hmm, that does sound a bit silly. And the next thing is my niece finishing university. Gone are the days when students celebrated down the pub when they got their degree. She's insisting on a fancy dress do, and the whole family has to be there. And she's actually posted a list of graduation presents on her Facebook thing. It's getting out of hand. Soon we'll be buying people presents for getting up in the morning and turning up at work or school. <laughs> Now you're just being silly. Some people would love to have a busy social life like yours. I know. 
I'm sorry. I must sound really mean. I just wish things would calm down a bit. Okay, let's go for lunch and get some fresh air. I can tell you about my plans for my 40th. Now you're just winding me up. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Ten point two. I know that some parents do go over the top. Why organize a big party for someone who won't even enjoy it? Ten point three, one. She is, and I don't mean to sound horrible. Two. Modern mums like to organise an event or a function. Three. It means the parents have to go along too. Four. Tell me about it. Five. She's insisting on a fancy dress do, and the whole family has to be there. Six. Now you're just winding me up. Eleven point one, speaker one. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was driving along quite happily, and the usual boy racers were overtaking and speeding past. When I looked over to the left and saw this old man in a mobility scooter crawling along the hard shoulder. Goodness knows how he got there. I guess he must have taken a wrong turning, and he ended up on the motorway by mistake. Anyway, I turned on the traffic news, and they said there was a lot of congestion in the area, and that the police were on the scene. The next day, I checked online, and luckily there hadn't been an accident or anything. The police had managed to get to the man and pick him up before anything went wrong. He seemed really confused, apparently. The poor guy. What really surprised me was the top speed of his scooter, only eight miles an hour, when everyone else was doing seventy. Ten point three. The landing is always the worst bit of the flight for me, but what made it worse was having to circle in the skies above the airport for more than half an hour. The weather was fine, so we couldn't work out what the problem was. The crew tried to keep everyone calm, and we eventually touched down about forty-five minutes late. We asked the ground staff what had happened, but we couldn't get an answer. It wasn't until we got home that we found out what the problem was. It turned out that the air traffic controller had fallen asleep. The pilot kept calling the control tower, but couldn't get an answer. Can you believe it? Actually falling asleep while a pilot is trying to land a plane. Apparently, the controller was suspended from his job for not being alert during working hours. Speaker three. I was at home killing time and just surfing the net when I came across a funny story. I'm a bit of a train fan, so it caught my eye. It was about this group of engineers who've been left with a lot of explaining to do, because the tunnel they built was too small for the trains. Can you imagine the inspectors turning up and measuring the roof, only to find it was too low to let any trains through? It was in Eastern Europe somewhere. Can't remember exactly where, but it was in a big city. Apparently, the team that was laying the new track and the guys that were building the tunnel didn't communicate very well. The ground under the tracks had been raised, and so the distance between tracks and the roof was shortened. It's bound to cost a fortune to put it all right. Speaker four. You hear a lot of disaster stories about people buying houses and then finding loads of problems with them, but a friend was telling me about a guy who bought a property you can only reach by helicopter. Apparently, he was a first-time buyer and he bought this old tower at auction to convert into a house. The thing he didn't realise was that the land around the house is private and there's no access. 
You can't drive or even walk to it from the main road. His only access is by air. What a nightmare! It seems that the house was a bit of a bargain, but the guy didn't check the legal position before he paid for it. So now he's got a huge old tower that he can't do anything with unless he gets his own helicopter and pilot. The silly thing is, the house only cost about thirty thousand pounds in the first place. Speaker five. I drive a lot for work, so I rely on my sat nav to help me get around. I think they're brilliant gadgets. Mine has saved me from getting stuck in the middle of nowhere on more than one occasion. But the navigation is only as good as the map, so you have to update pretty regularly, and you have to have a bit of common sense. I heard about this taxi driver who followed the sat nav's instructions so fully that he ended up in a river. He had to ring his boss and ask for help, and they found him still in the taxi, right in the middle of the water. <laughs> Apparently, the sat nav had said "go straight on," and so he did. It's unbelievable what some people will do. I heard that people are now calling the taxi company and asking to book river cruises. Eleven point two, one. He must have taken a wrong turning. What made it worse was having to circle in the skies. Two. The air traffic controller had fallen asleep. The usual boy races were overtaking. Three. The pilot kept calling the control tower. He ended up on the motorway by mistake. Four. People are asking to book river cruises. The tunnel they built was too small for the trains. Five. The navigation is only as good as the map. The sat nav had said, "Go straight on." Six. He's got a huge old tower. The guys building the tunnel didn't communicate very well. Twelve point one. Ah, here we go. The barbecue is getting going now. Be careful, Sam. It looks like it's getting very hot. Don't worry, it's fine. We've had hundreds of barbecues, and I've never burnt myself, have I? No, I know. It just makes me a bit nervous. Kate, relax. It's all under control. I'm going to head in and finish preparing the food. You will wash your hands, won't you? We don't want anyone getting an upset stomach. Yes, of course I will. Why don't you go and get changed and leave the food to me? Okay, I think I'll just take a painkiller. I'm getting a bit of a headache. Oh dear, you'll be okay for the party, won't you? Yes, I, I should be fine. Achoo! Sam, you're not getting a cold, are you? I've got a new herbal remedy you can try. Let me don't go. Don't worry, I'm fine. It's just this pepper I'm using. It went up my nose. Oh, okay. But you look a bit hot. Are you sure you feel okay? I've just been standing over the barbecue. That's all. I feel fine. People will be here soon, so why don't you open some wine? You can pour me a glass if you like. You're not going to drink too much tonight, are you? No, of course not. I've got loads of food to barbecue, and my new boss is coming tonight. Your boss? Yeah, you haven't forgotten, have you? Um. Well, it did slip my mind. I wish you'd reminded me, Sam. I'd have given the house a really good clean. Kate, our house is spotless. No bacteria could survive anywhere in our place. Oh. Uh, oh. oh. Oops. <laughs> Chuck me that piece of cheese, Kate. Waste not, want not. You're not going to eat it, are you? It's been on the floor. Well, it won't kill me, will it? A few germs never hurt anyone. Well, don't complain to me if you start throwing up later. Oh, the guests are arriving. I'll go and let them in. Thanks, darling. 
Thank goodness for that. Twelve point two. One. We've had hundreds of barbecues, and I've never burnt myself, have I? Two. You will wash your hands, won't you? Three. You'll be okay for the party, won't you? Four. Sam, you're not getting a cold, are you? Five. You're not going to drink too much tonight, are you? Six. Yeah, you haven't forgotten, have you? Seven. You're not going to eat it, are you? Eight. Well, it won't kill me, will it? Thirteen point one. Uh, hello. I don't think we've met. I'm James Burford. Emily Walker. Nice to meet you. Yes, you too. Um,、uh, I thought it was a lovely service, didn't you? And wonderful to see all these people here. Yes, Helen was obviously very well thought of. Yes, everyone loved her here in the village. She was such a character. <laughs> Did you know her well? Actually, she was my great aunt, but I hadn't been in touch for years. I can't say we were very close, but I wanted to pay my respects. I'm now wondering where all these people have come from. She never married or had children, so it's a bit of a surprise. Well, those ladies over there are from her writing group. She set it up last year, but I knew her from long before that, when she taught me French. Aunt Helen spoke French. Yes, she was head of French at my school. She joined the school when she came back from Africa. Uh, what was she doing in Africa? As far as I know, she was volunteering in Senegal. After she graduated, she wanted to travel, and she ended up there. She set up a teaching program with local teachers. This is amazing. Why didn't anyone ever tell me? So I guess you don't know about Helen's environmental campaign either. No. What was that? Now,、um, let me get this right. She retired from my old school about five years ago. And found herself at a loose end, and so she started touring the area on her old bike. <laughs> she was disgusted at the amount of damage to the local environment, and so she set about putting it right. I was told she won an award from the local council. This is such a revelation. I'd imagined Helen as an elderly lady living out her retirement in a quiet English village. No, no, not Helen. Apparently, she's always done things different. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know about the student strike she led at university? I knew she was the first female in her family to go to university, and that education was very important to her. But what's this about a strike? Well, she decided that the tuition that the female students were getting wasn't as good as the males, and so she and hundreds of other girls went on strike. Unsurprisingly, things got better quite quickly. Oh, I had no idea she'd had such an interesting life. She sounds amazing,、mm. but I'm a bit sad now. I wish that I'd seen her more often. There are lots of questions I'd like to ask. Well, it's difficult to stay in touch sometimes, but you'll be glad to hear that she's written her life story. It isn't published yet, but she's left that with me to organise. Really,、mm. that's fantastic. I'm sure it'll be a fascinating read. Thirteen point two, one. I wish that I'd seen her more often. No, what was that? Two. I'm now wondering where all these people have come from. Those ladies over there are from her writing group. Three. Nice to meet you. Did you know about the student strike? Four. There are lots of questions I'd like to ask. She ended up there. Five.
The education was very important to her. But I knew her from long before that. Six. Helen was obviously very well thought of. She was head of French at my school. Fourteen point one. One. Why are things taking so long? I've been trying to pay for over half an hour. I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. We're having problems with the computers. Does that mean I can't pay by credit card? I'm afraid so. It's cash only at the moment. What about a check? Well, I'm afraid we don't take checks anymore. Well, that's great. I haven't got any cash on me, so I'll have to leave it. Two. Did Eric tell you he'd applied for a mortgage? You're joking. He's already up to his eyes in debt. Not any more. His parents found his bank statement and went through the roof. What do you mean? They saw how big his overdraft was, and so they paid the whole lot off. Oh, it's okay for some. You and I have to pay our own way. No, no, it's only a loan. Eric will have to pay them every penny back. Oh well, I suppose it makes sense not to have to pay interest to the bank. Three. Join us on November twenty eighth for Buy Nothing Day. Anyone planning to go shopping then, do yourself a favor and have a day off from the things you really don't need. All those clothes that will hang in your closet for months unworn. Why not enjoy a whole twenty four hours of freedom from shops? Come on, support our campaign and say no to consumerism and the effects of globalization. Buy nothing for just one day on November twenty eighth. Four. You should have seen me on Saturday night, Frank. I was on the edge of my seat. Why? What happened? I was checking the lottery tickets, and I thought I'd got the big one. I was about to go out and buy some champagne. So, did you win? No, I was looking at the wrong ticket. What? Not even a small prize. Not even a tenner, and the jackpot was over five million. Just imagine. Oh. Five. Oh, what a nightmare! I checked my account online and found loads of purchases I hadn't made. Someone must have got hold of my card details and bought tons of stuff. I went straight to the bank to sort it out, and they made me feel a bit like a criminal, like I was the one who'd been on a spending spree. Of course, I'm hugely overdrawn now, and on top of that, there are fifty pounds worth of bank charges. It makes me feel like closing my account altogether. Fourteen point two, one. I've been trying to pay for over half an hour. Two. Did Eric tell you he'd applied for a mortgage? Three. He's already up to his eyes in debt. Four. They paid the whole lot off. Five. Come on, support our campaign. Six. I was looking at the wrong ticket. Seven. I went straight to the bank to sort it out. Fifteen point one. And now for our regular feature, Food Heaven, Food Hell. Today, our roving reporter Gina Erickson. Is on the streets of Brighton to ask people what gets their taste buds tingling and what attacks their appetite. Over to Gina. Yes, I'm here in the lanes, Brighton's famous shopping and eating area. So let's see what the locals have to say. Excuse me, can I just ask, what's your idea of food heaven and food hell? My food heaven is anything veggie. Salads, stir fries, anything without meat, really. But food hell has to be tofu. Although people think it's great for vegetarians, I think it's soggy and bland. 
And what about you? Um, for me, food heaven is a really gooey chocolate cake. My mum has a brilliant recipe. And food hell is fish. I just can't stand to see a whole fish with its head on looking up at me. Ugh. OK, thanks, ladies. And you, sir? Food heaven and hell, any thoughts? Well, as you can probably hear, I'm from the US, so I'd have to say the good old American burger and fries are my food heaven. And food hell, sorry to say this, is English tea. How come you guys drink so much of the stuff? It's a great British tradition. You can't beat a cup of tea. Thank you, and enjoy your stay in the UK. Now, there's a group of people sitting at a street cafe. Ladies and gents, do you mind if I ask about your food heaven and hell? This lady here, what would you say? Food heaven? <laughs> Let me think. Oh, there's nothing better than English strawberries and cream, but only in season. I don't understand people who buy summer fruits at Christmas. I'd agree with you there. And your food hell? Garlic. I just can't get on with it. No matter how little people put in it, I can taste it. My children just think I'm old-fashioned, but it's not for me. That's fair enough. And you, sir? Well, I'm just the opposite of my wife here. I love a good curry and rice. The hotter, the better. I got the taste for spicy food when I was in the army. A group of old mates and I meet up for curry about once a month. And I don't really have a food hell. I'll eat pretty much anything. Wonderful that you can agree to differ on your tastes. And a group of school kids here. Let's have a chat with them. Excuse me, what's your name? Darren. Hi, Darren. Can you tell us about your ideas of food, heaven and hell? Well, my favourite thing is meatballs and spaghetti in tomato sauce. I cook it every week. But the one thing I hate is cauliflower. I like lots of other vegetables, but my mum keeps trying to get me to eat cauliflower. It's disgusting. Sounds like we have a budding chef here in Darren. Let's hope he keeps it up. That's it from me and the people here in Brighton. Thanks to all of them for their ideas on food, heaven and hell. Fifteen point two. One. What's your idea of food heaven and food hell? Two. So I'd have to say the good old American burger and fries. Three. My children just think I'm old-fashioned, but it's not for me. Four. I got the taste for spicy food when I was in the army. Five. My favourite thing is meatballs and spaghetti in tomato sauce. Six. That's it from me and the people here in Brighton. Sixteen point one. Speaker one. Most people think that you go into business to make a fortune, but for us it just wasn't like that. Oh, don't get me wrong, it's good to make money, but that wasn't our main motivation. It all started 15 years ago when I came back to the UK with my Spanish husband after living in Seville for a few years. I found that I really missed all the wonderful food. Of course, I missed the people too, but getting Spanish ingredients was surprisingly hard especially outside London. After networking online with Spanish people living in the UK, I did some market research on the availability of Spanish food over here. I found that apart from in a few specialist shops, you couldn't get stuff like good chorizo, saffron or proper paella rice for love nor money. So I thought, why not set up a Spanish food business online? And that's just what we've done. We've just redesigned our first fairly rudimentary website and things are going from strength to strength. 2. Some people thought I was mad when I left my job. I'd worked my way up from junior designer to creative director in a well-known advertising company. And I suppose you could say I'd been very successful. 
But the higher I moved up the company, the more stressful it became. I spent more time travelling on planes than I did with my kids. Then, while I was catching up on paperwork on a flight, I started thinking about the creative side of the job. Uh, I picked up a pen and started doodling on my paper napkin. Before I knew it, I'd done about fifty different designs, and I suddenly realised that I didn't want to be a director anymore, but a designer. So, after persuading my wife this was the right thing to do, I resigned from my job and set up my own design agency, just me and two other talented youngsters. Sure, I don't earn half as much as I used to, but I really enjoy working for myself. Speaker 3 I had always sworn that I would never do it. I come from a long line of farmers, but I was completely adamant about working in a different sector. My great-grandparents bought and developed the land in the 1920s, and it's been passed down across the generations. While my older brother and sister took an avid interest in the animals and farm work, I ran off to college as soon as I could. After I graduated in medicine, I chose to work as a GP at an inner-city surgery, as I wanted to keep as far away from the farm as I could. Then things started to get very tough for farmers. I saw my parents age from the work and responsibility, and I felt bad about leaving all the admin to my brother and sister. So eventually I took early retirement, moved back to the old farmhouse, and I've taken on some of the behind-the-scenes work. I'll never be a country girl at heart, but you know what they say, blood's thicker than water. Speaker 4 I suppose you could say I fell into business. I didn't do particularly well at school and so ended up doing 9 to 5 or just temporary work. It wasn't very stimulating, but I didn't mind too much because I never had to work late or give up my weekends. I'd always been interested in fashion and was pretty good at designing and making my own clothes. Then my friends started asking me to make things for them. I did this as a favour or gave them away as presents. Then one day, a group of friends and I were out in town wearing some of my designs. I couldn't believe it when this guy walked up and asked where we'd bought them. I explained that they were all hand-designed and the next thing I knew he was offering to help me set up a small business. It turned out he ran an enterprise scheme for young clothes designers. He helped me find a workshop, get funding for equipment and materials and now the orders are rolling in. Speaker 5 I never expected to have a career in business, let alone be running my own company. It all started when I was teaching English as a foreign language in Berlin. A friend of a friend asked me to do some one-to-one -one classes with a businesswoman who wanted help with presentation skills. She had such a busy schedule that we met at very odd hours of the day, 5.30 in the morning before she went to work, or late in the evening when she'd finished. I ended up getting quite a can-do attitude because I was willing to give classes any time and anywhere within reason. Most of the other language schools and tutors weren't available much outside general working hours, which wasn't much use to people with a packed schedule. Word spread, and then a few colleagues and I went freelance and set up a network of tutors. Five years later, here I am with an agency of language teachers in 20 different cities, all of whom cater their timetable and tuition to the exact needs of the client. Sixteen point two, one. Why not set up a Spanish food business online? Two. We've just redesigned our first fairly rudimentary website. Three. I spent more time travelling on planes. Four. I'd done about fifty different designs. Five. My older brother and sister took an avid interest in the animals. Six. After I graduated in medicine, I chose to work as a GP. Seven. 
Eventually, I took early retirement. 8. I ended up doing 9 to 5 or just temporary work. 9. We worked late in the evening when she'd finished.